Welcome back everyone, Acid Glow here. I'm going to continue the lore videos around film and movies. This one again is another compilation of different franchises. It includes topics around different movies like Split Second, Pitch Black, Skyline, Pumpkinhead, The Shadow, Terminator, and more. These videos are meant to discuss the various enemies, creatures, demons, or villains in a movie. While I do include the established information that's present in the movies, I also go a bit deeper by bringing up deleted scenes, information from other sources, and piecing together what might be left out from the movie. This can give us a better understanding of the entire story. So if you like sci-fi movies, this would be a good video to check out. Now keep in mind, these are older videos I did from a few years ago. I'm going to include timestamps this way, you can skip to a franchise of interest. Thanks for watching, and please leave a like rating on it. What was the creature in the movie Split Second in 1992? The movie itself takes place in the year 2008, when climate change has affected the planet. And because of constant rain in London, this has caused some underground areas to become flooded with water. There's also been a huge increase in the rat population, and now they carry some sort of virus that's spreading around. There's also a killer in the city, and it kills its victims by ripping out their hearts. The story focuses on Harley Stone, a police officer that lost his partner to the monster a long time ago. And for some reason, he has a psychic connection to the killer. He can hear its heartbeat when it's nearby. This is later explained that the psychic link is caused by the claw marks on his body. Stone received it from the monster when his partner died in front of him. Because of the psychic connection he has to the monster, he knows where it's going to strike next. Now, although it is some type of monster, it does have some level of intelligence. There was an astrological symbol of Scorpio painted in blood. They mentioned that Scorpio is a water sign, which is also linked to magic, souls, and something about finishing the circle and the occult. It later turns out that Harley is also a Scorpio, which might be why it's always nearby. When they bring up the astrological stuff, it's supposed to be linked to the high tides, the full moon, and the alignment of the stars. The creature kills on the night of a new moon right before midnight and then disappears. When a half-eaten heart is delivered to the police station, they examine it and the teeth are not human. The creature appears to be humanoid, but still, different in some way. The genetic fingerprints show that this creature has the DNA structure of all its victims, along with rat DNA. The creature believes that if it consumes the heart, it will gain their soul and power. The signs it carves during its ritual is supposed to represent protection from the outside world. It's also mentioned that the inverted triangle is a symbol of evil and water. When they are put together, it is a sign of magic and power. This is also linked to their current year in the movie, 2008, which is the year of the rat. Scorpio is supposed to be the sign mostly influenced by the powers of darkness. They have a big importance of being joined with a supernatural being called Satan. When Dick Durkin is attacked, he gets intricate signs carved into his body. This is a map leading to its lair in the subway. The end of the map leads to where Stone's partner was killed a long time ago. If Stone is killed here, it will complete the circle. The creature is eventually killed off in the end by getting its heart ripped out by Stone, but later on, air bubbles are seen coming from the water. This could mean there's more than one creature running around. The creature's design was humanoid in some way. Its head was large, round, and with lots of sharp pointed teeth in its mouth, and for some reason, it had a visor over its eyes. While its torso and arms looked human by its muscle definition, its fingers have formed into very long claws. Now, it's never explained what the creature is, it just hints on what it's made of. I'm guessing it's a human that was infected by the rat virus, and then it mutated into what we saw now. The movie itself had different names over time, first starting off with Black Tide, then Split Second. Later on, it was called Killer Instinct, and also Detective Stone. They also changed part of the script because it resembled ideas from another movie. Some deleted scenes included the creature killing a jogger, and also Stone would meet the girlfriend of Dick Durkin. Now, what I liked about the movie was that the monster was not a mindless killer. It was intelligent, 
It also had a connection to astrological signs. In some way, it was trying to become a demon. So that covers the creature in the movie Split Second in 1992. If you've seen this movie, tell me what you think about it. The Bioraptor creature appeared in the 2000 movie Pitch Black. They were seen on the planet M6117, which was a dry, lifeless desert. At least, that's what it looked like during the day. It seems this planet goes through a planet-wide eclipse every 22 years. This would last several months. This eclipse was caused by the aligning of the surrounding planets and stars. When darkness falls, the bioraptors emerge to feed, and there are a lot of them. This period of a long eclipse is when they go on a mass feeding frenzy similar to locust swarms. Because they've spent most of their lives in darkness, they remain underground when the sun is out. But the planet seemed to show no other signs of life. The bioraptors could have eaten all the other life forms on the planet. For the planet to have so much sunlight, there's no real explanation as to why this light-sensitive species would be there. Perhaps they were brought there by mistake, or planted here as a bioweapon. We don't really have any answers on that topic. Riddick and some survivors would encounter them and fight for survival, but Riddick was able to see them in the dark, thanks to his eyeshine vision. They were seen in two stages. The infants appeared as small-winged creatures. They would travel together and be extremely dangerous in a pack, tearing away at the victim and even lifting them into the air as they feed on the body. The adults would emerge from their caverns after the infants. Because they have no eyes, these creatures hunt by echolocation and also by the scent of blood. There are long stalks on either side of their head that contain these ultrasonic sensors. Their blind spot is between them but directly in front of their mouth. The overall length of these stalks is around 6 feet long. The head is made up of hard bone, while the rest of the body is fleshy and vulnerable to injury. Their tails are long with two curved tips. The tail can be used for balance or to hold onto their prey. Their feet resemble a lizard with four large talons in the front. They can hold onto their prey with their feet, while their wings are strong enough to fly away with them. Their mouths are filled with long, sharp teeth and are physically stronger than average humans. Their legs are so powerful they can jump long distances. Their body design could resemble a dragon in some way. While the planet they were found on seemed to have no other life forms on the surface, they would resort to eating their own kind, mostly the younger ones. But in some cases, they would swarm another adult to feed on its body. Since they spend most of their time underground, they grew accustomed to hunting in the dark. The sound waves emitted by the biraptors used for echolocation could be heard by humans. One organism that has survived with the biraptors were the bio slugs. It seems their light emitting properties is what keeps the bioraptors away. They were used as a light source by the crew trying to escape. You can use bladed weapons or firearms to defeat them. A simple flashlight is also effective at holding them back. It causes a burning effect on their skin which makes them retreat. It's possible their skin tissue is weak and easily cut because they are deficient in protein. This is due to the planet not having any other life forms or plants to eat. They do not have any sapient level of intelligence to comprehend the mass extinction they caused. They simply just feed until everything is gone. Their blood color was blue, possibly due to the low oxygen atmosphere. The young bioraptors served as inspiration to the krill creatures in the Gears of War video game. Its original design was supposed to resemble a pterodactyl and they were called predators, but this was changed later on. And the way they reproduce was not explained. If you enjoy this kind of stuff on the channel, then be sure to leave a like rating on this video. I'll be doing more videos like this in the future, so stay tuned. What are the aliens in the movie Skyline? Since there are two movies in this franchise, I'll try to cover as much as I can about these aliens. The first movie opens up with blue energy balls falling down in California. The light emitting from these things starts to change the appearance of a character called Jared almost as if it's infecting him in some way. These events are just a preview of what unfolds later in the story. We are then taken back to what happened before this, introducing us to other characters like Jared and his girlfriend Elaine who is pregnant, Candace, Terry, Ray and a few others. During that night, this is when the aliens invade Earth and their technology is far superior to humans. The light emitting from the blue spheres had some type of hypnotic effect 
humans that looked upon the light would be drawn towards it, unable to look back, losing control of their actions. Jared even said himself, I was being pulled towards this light. The blue spheres dropped on the city were meant to attract humans to one location, and then a giant ship would pull them upwards. Hundreds, if not thousands, could be pulled up in a single ship in a minute. What we know about them throughout the movie is that they are biomechanical in nature, which means they are a combination of flesh and machine, and their sole purpose for this invasion is to harvest human brains. The movies have different alien types, which I'll go over. The Hydras are considered to be living organisms. They are the giant craft that drop the blue ball of light on the city, and inside they have an alien sorter. It uses a three-pronged claw and a razor blade to extract the human brains. They act as a transport vessel for smaller units. Now, while they are not meant for combat, they will act as suicide bombers if they have to. And here we have the drones which resemble flying squids or octopus. They hunt down any humans who are not lured by the blue light. They are also known to engage in combat if necessary, but are also tasked with maintenance of the mothership. After a nuclear strike by the humans, the drones are seen to help repair the damage on the ship. They are controlled by human brains, and if they need a replacement, they can only function without a brain for a few minutes until a suitable brain is found. The tankers are very big and strong, seen mainly as a ground unit. They go about the city to gather any live prey. A pilot would control the tanker, and their vision is through some sort of holographic HUD. All these humans who would then be taken into the mothership, and their brains would be taken. While they are very resilient, their main weakness is to high caliber explosives like a rocket launcher or tank shell. But just like the drones, their skin is highly flammable. The workers appeared later in the story. It's possible they use these bodies to control other life forms, but they still require a brain to function. When it comes to their body structure, it could resemble a primate or gorilla. The arms were long as they dragged their knuckles on the floor. Their face would have multiple blue eyes, and the skin appears to be slimy and brown. The hive mind is the purest form of the alien species. They command the alien forces during the attack on Earth. It is also seen to pilot a hive mind tanker unit. This one is far stronger than the others. Various modifications are made to this one, allowing it to be more agile and it can fire energy blasts. It also comes with a retractable claw and that blue light used on humans. And this here is the warrior. They were the result of human brains being directly implanted into a biomechanical alien body. This subject would then be controlled by the hive mind from the mothership. Because their anatomy is based on humans, they act as foot soldiers, which means their weakness is the neck or head. These new bodies give them incredible strength, able to rip human limbs apart fairly easily. This also brings up the question of what happens when someone escapes the blue light. Jared was pulled away from the light and started to manifest some strange markings on his body. His eyes would also change in appearance and color. He would later display increased strength. He would also develop immunity to the blue light, since he escaped its control a few times. Jared's brain is later taken and put into a worker body, but his brain is red, not blue like the others. It's possible this is because he was not under the mind control, so he was free to fight back. They were later called red light aliens. Then we have the hybrid aliens. This is the result of a pregnant woman being exposed to the blue light. Rose, who is the daughter of Jared and Elaine, ended up turning into an evolved alien. But during this process, her body would grow much quicker, which resulted in Elaine's death when she gave birth. Hybrids, or evolved aliens, would reach the age of 30 years old in a matter of 10 years. Hybrids would require a blood transfusion because their bodies grow too fast. This new hybrid would not be affected by any form of mind control of the hive mind. It also has the power to cut the connection between the warrior and the hive mind alien. The first movie is about the invasion and ends on a cliffhanger, with Jared's brain being planted into an alien body. The second movie takes place around the same night the invasion begins, however, it introduces new characters and expands the story. It also turned into some type of martial arts movie along the way, but it was fun to see the new alien types. There were also different concept art pieces released by Studio EDI, which shows how each alien type would have differed from the final result. So that covers the aliens and the two movies Skyline. 
If you saw this movie, what did you think about it? Tell me in the comment section. For each of man's evils, a demon exists. You're looking at vengeance, cruel, devious, pure as venom, vengeance. The character Haggis was seen in a few Pumpkinhead movies. She's been linked to the creature as the one who conjures it during a ritual. Her past was never explored in the films, but in 2008, Dynamite Entertainment would publish a new comic book series. The story was spread over five issues, and it gave us a deeper look into how Haggis became known as the Old Witch of the Woods. It opens up in Bradley Mountain a long time ago. An old woman is surrounded by a group of girls. They are sent out to raise her back holler, to search and find the grave that calls out to them. These bodies will be the ones each of them will watch over throughout their lives. As the others find the one meant for them, Haggis looks up and moves closer to the one above. For each of man's evils, a special demon exists. Now, in the present time, we meet the local sheriff in Wrightson Mills. She's been looking at a hit-and-run incident that happened recently. The victim's family, the Kincaids, are not helping her with any information. She thinks they might take matters into their own hands and seek their own form of justice. We get to meet a prisoner named Bunt, a local man who knows what's going to happen. Vengeance is coming for whoever hurt them kids. Over at Black Ridge, Haggis is visited by Ernst Kincaid. He brings the bodies of family members that passed away from the hit and run incident. He says to her, I want vengeance. Clayton is the man responsible for this incident. He is being protected by Lucas until his father arrives to take him back to Memphis. But a woman named Bedelia knows there is something out there. Everyone should be on the edge, especially Clayton. And shortly after, Pumpkinhead shows up in a barn and starts his attack on the nearby men in search of the one who is marked, Clayton. As part of the ritual to bring forth Pumpkinhead, the one who wants vengeance shall see the outcome of their victims through the eyes of Pumpkinhead. Ernst Kincaid will feel the pain and torment of those who wronged him. Pumpkinhead finds his way into the house where Clayton is staying. The woman there, Bedelia, calls out the creature's name, Pumpkinhead. She knows what this creature is. She says, it's vengeance made flesh. She, along with Lucas and Clayton, escape and make their way to Nettie's home. Anyone who grants Clayton sanctuary will also be marked. So they devise a plan to fight back and call upon their own demons that they were meant to watch over. These women were the same girls from the beginning of the story. They see each other as sisters amongst this group. Each demon would represent a sin of man, pride, greed, envy, lust, and sloth. Mildred was the seventh member of this group. She called upon her demon one time, but it went out of control, feeding on anything it found. Mildred was not fit to control it, and the demon turned on her. Bedelia explains these demons actually want to get rid of Pumpkinhead. They are jealous in how often vengeance is called upon, while the other demons are left forgotten. Despite taking damage to its body, Pumpkinhead is able to heal any wounds and continue his onslaught. Three demons would fight against Pumpkinhead, while the other two would look for Ernst Kincaid and Haggis. If you're wondering what Razorback Holler is, it's not only the resting place of Pumpkinhead, but it's a graveyard for many other demons of hell. One of the demons chases Haggis through the woods, but Pumpkinhead finds her and fights the other demon. The battle is short and ends with Pumpkinhead getting a sharp weapon impaled into his back, but this only slows him down as he rises once again and tracks down four other demons. Another battle occurs with four of them taking on Pumpkinhead alone. It gets to a point when the sheriff meets up with Haggis, and together they try to find the other women who called up the other demons. There's even a point when Ed Harley was mentioned. The character Bunt is most likely the one from the first movie. They track down the other sisters of Haggis, and she takes it upon herself 
to eliminate all of them quickly. This breaks the connection they have with the other demons, and all that's left is Pumpkinhead. It will not stop until it finds its mark. Shortly after, Clayton is captured by the demon and eliminated. It is done. After this, Ernst Kincaid starts to fade away. He got his justice. The sheriff tries to stop Haggis from taking Pumpkinhead's tiny body, but Haggis tells her, you cannot stop vengeance, no matter how hard you try, it will crawl out of hell on its own. With her sisters now gone, Haggis becomes the watcher over all the other demons. Someone needs to keep their hand on the leash. It's a terrible burden, but it's one she's been counting on since she was a little girl. You cannot stop vengeance, no matter how hard you try. The End Since we're talking about the comic books here, I might as well mention the unfinished series in 1993. Pumpkinhead appeared in two issues called Pumpkinhead, The Rites of Exorcism. It was published by Dark Horse Comics. Only two issues were released at the time. There was going to be a third called Pumpkinhead, The Metamorphosis. There was a fourth issue planned as well, but the last two were not officially released. The story focused on a woman named Maria, who meets up with Haggis, the witch from the original movie. Maria is due to take the place of the Guardian of the Dark Secret. This is the position Haggis has maintained throughout her life. After her birth, Maria's body and soul were sold to Haggis in exchange for her family to receive a lifetime of rich harvest. Maria plans to run away with a man named David. She ends up teaching David the ritual to bring up Pumpkinhead, but she gets killed by thugs and David takes it upon himself to get revenge. One part in the story changes the mythology of it being a demon. It says Pumpkinhead is very old. According to prehistoric cave paintings, it could belong to a species that walked this earth as far back as 3 million years. The title of this comic book series, The Rites of Exorcism, is linked to a new character named Angus Brenner. He tells David he was once like him, connected to Pumpkinhead, but somehow he was able to break free. He's in town searching for those like him, but the rest of the story was linked to issues 3 and 4, which was not released in the same manner. A winged version of Pumpkinhead was going to be featured in issue number 3, but the last two issues, number 3 and 4, were never officially released. In 1991, Geometric Designs created a Pumpkinhead model kit. It was in a burnt out church. This model was discontinued in 1994 when they revealed a new version with wings. This one was called Pumpkinhead, The Metamorphosis. It shared the same title as the third comic book issue. It also says that it came with a copy of the cancelled comic book sequel. I read online that this copy were issues 3 and 4 but they were condensed into one book, so this might have been the only way to get it. And as to the reason why this creature is called Pumpkinhead, it was inspired by a poem written by Ed Justin. He is credited for being a writer, but only because a part of his poem is placed into the script. The poem itself was not written for the movie in 1988. A short version of it was used for the first film, but if you want to hear the full version, here it is. Keep away from Pumpkinhead, unless you're tired of living. His enemies are mostly dead. He's mean and unforgiving. Laugh at him and you're undone, but in some dreadful fashion. Vengeance he considers fun and plans it with a passion. Time will not erase or blot. A plot that he has brewing. It's when you think that he's forgot. He'll conjure your undoing. Bolted doors and windows barred. Guard dogs prowling in your yard. Won't protect you in your bed. Nothing will from Pumpkinhead. So that covers the lore around Haggis, the old witch of the woods. It explains how she became the watcher of the demons in Razorback Holler. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more stuff like this, then subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications. This way you get notified when I upload a video. I've also covered other franchises in film, so check out my playlist on lore and history. You might find something else to watch. It's filled with topics on comic books, film, video games, and novels. I would appreciate a like rating before you go. I'm always looking into other franchises, so stay tuned for more content like this. 
What is the story behind Riddick's mysterious eye shine ability that lets him see in the dark? To better understand this, we're going to have to go back to a time before Riddick was even born, a time when the Furian race was alive. Long before Riddick's birth, a necromonger officer named Zilla would consult an elemental seer who told him that someday in the future, a Furian male would be born. This Furian would be responsible to take down Zilla, and so he planned to change the outcome of his fate. He attacked the people of Furia, massacred all the male children, even strangling the newborn infants with their umbilical cords. Riddick was presumed to have died during this, but he survived. As Riddick grew up, he saw images of his memories back on Furia, including those of the massacre. He believed his mother tried to strangle him at a young age and left him in the trash bin behind a liquor store. The Necromongers were a religious empire. They traveled through space and conquered worlds either by force or by converting the survivors into Necromongers. They believed that their religion was the one true religion. This empire was led by many Lord Marshals over time. The current leader during this time was Zilla. While the soldiers view death as honorable, they also follow the rule of you keep what you kill. This means you own the property and position of the person you defeat in battle. The Necromongers speak of a place called the Underverse. They view it as the Promised Land. Each Lord Marshal must travel alone to a portal called the Threshold to reach the Underverse. This journey could take months, but when a Lord Marshal returns, they come back changed, different from before. Lord Marshal Zilla discovered an ancient artifact on Helium Prime. It held the secrets of the Threshold. After he studied it, he destroyed it so no one would find it. He used that knowledge to unlock the secrets of the Soul Power. Able to use powers that no other before him could use, he became the most powerful Lord Marshal in history. While Riddick's childhood remains a mystery, when he got older he joined the military. This is where he learned how to pilot ships. He held a job of killing venomous lizards until he was promoted to the Strike Force Academy on Sigma 3's moon. This is where he received all of his combat training. He learned everything there is to know about killing. During his time at Strike Force, he witnessed how the security teams would enforce murder and torture. When Riddick spoke up about the horrible treatment, the evidence he presented was thrown out and he was sent to prison. He would later shoot two guards and a pilot before escaping the prison. This is what led Riddick down a path of being a criminal and chased by many bounty hunters. Over some period of time, Riddick would receive visions from another Furian named Shira. The video game Escape from Butcher's Bay served as a prequel to the movie Pitch Black. Riddick goes to see Pope Joe to put stitches onto his arm, but after this, Shira contacts Riddick and she tells him that he has been blind for far too long and is going to receive a gift. Then she awakens the dormant power within him. This is when he gains the eye shine ability. But in the movie Pitch Black, Riddick tells Jack that he got sent to the slam and he paid a doctor 20 menthol cools for the surgery. Menthol cools are just cigarettes. The surgery was also brought up in a flash video game called Hunt for Riddick. It was also brought up again in the second movie, The Chronicles of Riddick. When Kira confronts Riddick about the surgery, she says she could not find any doctor that could have done that procedure, so she thinks Riddick lied to her. During a deleted scene in the Chronicles of Riddick, Shira contacts Riddick and awakens his dormant power, the Wrath of Furians. This ability was also shown in the video game Escape from Butcher's Bay. The necromonger Vako even mentions that when they invaded Furia, he saw another male Furian with similar eyes like Riddick. He had a lot of endurance and was strong enough to take out multiple necromongers. This trait would only be seen in alpha males of the Furian race. So to sum it up, Riddick's eye shine is not from a surgery, it is a hidden power of the Furian alpha males. The video game Escape from Butcher's Bay and the three movies seem to connect around this idea a lot more than it just being a surgery. The Chronicles of Riddick even mentions that sometimes you need to fight evil with another kind of evil. This could be referring to the warrior race known as the Furians. If they have some type of special power, it makes more sense to use them against the necromongers. This idea of Riddick having a special power is a bigger threat than someone who just got eye surgery. So which idea do you think fits better into the story? The special power or the surgery? Tell me in the comment section. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men?
only the shadow knows. So in this video, I wanted to cover the character known as the shadow. Starting back in the 1930s, this character was designed as a superhero. It began in the novels and then extended to magazines, radio shows, comic books, comic strips, television, video games, and some movies. Since the shadow was one of the earliest superheroes in various forms of media, it was a big influence to other comic book superheroes, specifically Batman. At the same time, it also shares a similar character to Bruce Wayne. Both characters are based around a very wealthy person who takes up the mantle of a crime-fighting superhero. The tagline of who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men, only the shadow knows. This was used on the radio show, but later on, a few versions were used at the end of each episode like these two. As you sow evil, so shall you reap evil. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. And also this one. The weed of crime bears bitter fruit. Crime does not pay. The shadow knows. Part of this line was used in the 1994 movie, The Shadow. The radio show was pretty much a way to boost the sales of the Detective Story magazine. And early on, during the inception of The Shadow on the radio show, while they were trying to find a narrator with a sinister voice, they were trying to come up with a proper name for the crime fighter we know today. They tried to use the inspector, but that was too common at that time, then the sleuth, but that did not seem too catchy, and so they tried the name The Shadow, and they just stuck with it. The identity of The Shadow has changed over different sources. It was originally Lamont Cranston, then it was changed to Kent Allard, who would use the name Lamont Cranston to cover up his true identity, and then later on it was changed to John Harverson. But in one of the comic books, Lamont Cranston was just an agent working for the Shadow, so the Shadow's true identity has been mixed around over the different sources. The origin of this superhero can differ depending on which source you look at. In the radio show, he got his powers from studying under the guidance of a yogi priest in the Temple of Cobras at Delhi, India. There he learned the power to cloud men's minds. This gives him the illusion of invisibility, when in fact, the men cannot see him because their minds are blocked out from seeing his physical form, but his shadow is still visible. This power also changes his voice to become more intimidating. It's also been listed that his powers can be cancelled out by the use of the temple bells of Niban. This was brought up in the radio show from 1937. The shadow has also been known to have powers of telepathy and to detect the presence of danger. They also mentioned that the shadow was a master of hypnotism. The source of the shadow's powers in the comic books was also changed around. During a plane crash over the Tibetan mountains, Kenilard's body was found amongst the rubble. His body was taken and reassembled by the local people. He had come across a scientifically advanced city just by accident. There he met Rudra Kakran and fell in love. When his body was reassembled, he became physically enhanced, better than before. And so, he was put through training and he was taught how to use his mind to travel beyond his body. He would then fly back home and become the crime-fighting hero known as the Shadow. The movie adaptation from 1994 might be the one that most people are familiar with. The story does mention Lamont Cranston again, but this time, he became a warlord in Tibet named Yin Ko. Later on, he's kidnapped by the servants of Tulku. Lamont is brought in for redemption. Tulku explains that Lamont was in pain for a long time, struggling to fight against his own dark shadows. While he's there, he learns the secrets of the mystical arts, and later on, he uses his skills to fight against evil. When the shadow uses his powers, you can see his eyes change. Sometimes, they appear as completely black, and other times, they have a silver shine depending on the lighting. Tulku taught him how to cloud men's minds, to fog their force of concentration, leaving behind the only thing he can never hide, his shadow. The movie also introduces Furba, a mystical sentient flying dagger. It can only be controlled by someone with a strong mind. Lamont would then return to New York City to fight against crime as the shadow. There he would have a large group of agents that reported to him about any recent crimes in the city. Back in 2006, there was supposed to be a new Shadow movie from Columbia Pictures, but in 2007, the director, Sam Raimi, had said they are trying to work on a story that will do justice for the character. Later in 2012, he said that they were not able to produce a good script, and so the film would not be produced as planned. 
Now, a lot of people always wondered, what was the ring used by the shadow? The shadow's ring acts as a beacon between the shadow and his agents. Once it lights up, that means there's an emergency. The ring can also be used to hypnotize certain people. One thing I've liked about the shadow is that he's just a man who acquired his powers through training, and it's that power that is used to terrify the criminals he pursues. And just like Batman, he mostly operates at night, appearing as a vigilante, fighting crime in the name of justice. There was actually a comic book about the shadow and the Batman, so check it out if you can. So that covers the shadow. Are you a fan of this character? Let me know in the comment section. It has traveled across time and space, an energy force unlike any in the universe. It is powerful, intelligent, and it has found the perfect planet to inhabit. Now, in order to survive, it must destroy the one threat to its existence, the virus called man. For today's video, we'll be looking at the comic book story of Virus, written by Chuck Farr. The comic book was released in 1992. A film of the same story was released in January of 1999. And then, the comic book story was released again, but as a graphic novel. There are a few differences between the comic book and the movie, so I'll try to point them out as we go along. The first thing we see in the comic book is the opening scene of a typhoon. We meet the crew aboard the commercial tugboat, the Electra. It's hauling in $10 million worth of cargo. As things get out of control, Averill, who works on the lower deck, tells the captain he will not prep the engines for full throttle. He cares more about the team when Captain Powell mainly cares about the cargo. They argue about who is doing the right choice here, but the fact is, water is building up on the cargo they are pulling. When it gets too much, it will roll over and pull their ship down with it. Realizing he has no other choice, Captain Powell orders them to cut the cable. By using an acetylene tank, they toss it, ignite it with a flare, and it cuts the cable. They are safe, for now. When morning comes, they assess the damage to the ship. They lost the antennas for the satellite navigation. They have no idea where they are, but they could be 150 miles off course. They come across a lifeboat and a deceased body, but right away they pick up something on the radar, something big, but it's also not moving. As they head towards the location, they find a Chinese research vessel. It's been assigned to Chinese naval forces. According to law, ships that are abandoned on international waters become derelict. Whoever finds it gets the claim. Before we continue with the comic book story, there are some differences from the film. The first thing is the introduction. A key part of the story occurs during the opening of the movie. A Russian space station is stuck in the path of a giant energy force. It comes out of nowhere. As it hits the station, it connects through its equipment and beams itself down to Earth. The abandoned ship that is found is Russian in the movie but Chinese in the comic book. And the ship Mr. Powell has in the comic book is the Electra, but in the movie it's called the Sea Star. Since the comic book story has nothing mentioned about this unknown energy force from space, the reader is left to come up with their own ideas of why this ship is abandoned. As Mr. Averell boards the ship, he finds two deceased bodies on the bridge. He takes a pistol from one of them and goes back to inform his team. Even though everything is shut down, he is ordered to try to bring everything back up. Mr. Averill explores the bottom deck with another shipmate. They discover the ship is nuclear powered. It seems like the crew shut the reactor off when they abandoned the ship. They turn on the power, but it's only enough to turn the lights on. Because Captain Powell wants to salvage the entire ship and its contents, he decides to pull it with his tiny ship. Things go wrong, they suffer a casualty, and Mr. Powell gets injured. Their ship is also damaged and sinking. Not only was the reactor shut off, but the crew on board this ship also smashed every radio and the teletypes were fried. This vessel was used for tracking satellites. They need to find out what happened. Despite everything being destroyed, Malone would try to work with what she has. 
Perhaps she can send out an SOS with Morse code. Meanwhile, Mr. Averell goes to find bandages and medicine for Captain Powell. As Miss Foster reaches the mission control room, her face appears on the TV monitors and is confronted by something very strange. This thing is mechanical with wings, but also appears organic in some way. Mr. Averill rushes in and smashes the thing with an axe. They have a closer look at it and they discover it's got gyros, electric motors, and a circuit board. The power source is probably from the body parts of the deceased. Somebody or something stayed behind. The team finds out that the lifeboats were cut and set loose, but who did this? The blame is put on a team member, but he's innocent. A previous incident involved the anchor that smashed through their boat. It just dropped on its own. This scene was expanded upon in the movie. The virus takes control of the ship's computers and drops the anchor on their boat. It's trying to keep them on the ship. Moments later, a plane flies by, but it's not here to rescue them. It opens fire on the ship, trying to destroy it. But the microwave dishes start operating on their own, and it deflects the missiles. The team realizes that things got weird after they turned the power on. So their task now is to cut the circuit breakers. Appia and Richie are sent down below to throw every bus connector they can find. As they have one more connector left, Richie stays behind to drink a bottle he finds. He then hears a noise and goes in the hallway, only to meet up with something. It's a combination of robotic and organic parts. Appia ends up saving him by turning on the firebox. Richie is so distressed and shook up he can barely comprehend what he saw. He just says, that goddamn thing came after me. It was like a robot. It has eyes, real eyes. It was coming after me. As they examine the hallway where this occurred, they discover that something is tapping into the main computer buses. Whatever this thing is, it needs the ship's power to operate. They follow the slime trail even further down below hoping to cut the power at the source. But when they reach the generator room, they find out something big has took the generator away. But there are more problems. Miss Foster explains the circuits came back on five minutes ago. First, the forward part of the ship, then the engineering spaces. The whole ship is powered up again, not by the generator, but by the nuclear reactor. As Captain Powell recovered from his injury, he takes command and orders his team to bring the ship to the nearest port. The prospect of monetary gain is too much to pass up. Four other crew members join him, while Miss Foster and Mr. Averill disagree. Even though they patched up the hull from the missile attack, he knows the ship won't make it. The only option they have is to shut down the engines, but Averill knows something is down there. They locate a TV room and play a recorded tape it goes over some details of what happened on board the ship. On May 7th, research scientists from the People's Republic succeeded in establishing a deep space communication link with an extraterrestrial intelligence. Two-way communication was established at 1405 Zulu Mean Time with a VLF radio source in the Pleiades system. The first communication consisting of 20,000 megabytes of binary code is now being deciphered by the ship's onboard computers. May 7th was two days before they found this ship, when they were caught in a typhoon. Whatever happened on board must have been worse if they stayed, so crew members might have abandoned the ship during the typhoon. Perhaps the binary code they put into their computer was not a signal of communication, but in fact, maybe a code for a virus. It seems like the Chinese are aware of what happened, so they're trying to sink the ship. They might come back to finish the job. In the movie, this scene is different. The crew uses a computer to communicate with this thing or entity within the computer system. It speaks back by saying this, I am aware. Life form analysis complete. Species is destructive, invasive, noxious, harmful to the body of the whole. You are virus. When they ask what it wants, it gives out a list, all attached to an optic nerve. It simply wants humans as spare parts to create 
its own cyborg body. Meanwhile, Mr. Averill and Miss Foster locate the propeller room. If they reduce the amount of gears, the propeller won't turn. If that doesn't function, then they won't move. Back on the bridge, they notice the ship is slowing down. So Richie is sent to find the captain. But upon locating him, we see that Captain Powell and Malone are now different. As Captain Powell approaches the bridge, Richie realizes what happened to Captain Powell. He was transformed into a cyborg. He attacks Hooker and Richie until Avril shows up. By using a pistol, the bullets only seem to slow Powell down a bit. So Avril grabs an axe and slashes at Powell over and over until he stops moving. In the movie version, Captain Everton talks to the entity through a computer. He agrees to help it in exchange for one thing. Everton would appear later on the bridge, but he's now a cyborg like the others. This version of the captain does not last long in the story. But things don't end here. Malone, who is now a cyborg as well, comes smashing through the wall. She's not here to fight. She merely recovers the body of Powell. The survivors would then devise another plan. By using a Chinese to English dictionary, they read over the ship's blueprints and locate a weapons room. Now armed with more firepower, they can fight back. And maybe they could survive this encounter. Before they can leave the room, they are attacked by another cyborg. They unload their weapons on it, but it's not enough. So Avril would toss a grenade and the explosion only slows it down. Malone is spotted going to the satellite. If she fixes the uplink, they can transmit their data to any computer in the world. They quickly get rid of Malone, and she comes falling down from the satellite. Even though the propellers were damaged by Averill, the virus is self-aware of what's going on. It even tries to build its own plane to escape, but that is dealt with shortly after. And things get even more interesting. Not only was that just a plane, that vehicle was also part cyborg in some way, just like the others. They pour oil on the floor, and they defend a hallway. The previous enemy finds them again, so they light it on fire, hoping it works. You can't just shoot them, you have got to get rid of every piece. During this encounter, Richie was sent to gather wood for the barricade, but has not returned. We then hear his voice in the distance, Help me. Please, somebody, help. They follow his voice, but cautiously. As they go deeper into the darkness, they find Richie, but it's too late. He's already gone. His head was used by one of the cyborgs. Richie's voice was used to lure them into a trap. The group runs back through a doorway and seals it, but the cyborg follows them. They rig a few grenades and it explodes as the cyborg breaks through the door. Despite their attempts of disabling the ship's movement, the virus still manages to get the engines fixed. They are now headed for Oahu, Hawaii. If it reaches the port, it can spread much faster. They have to do something. As they search around the ship, they come across a factory. This is where the cyborgs are created. They are then attacked by another enemy once again, but this time use water to slow it down. They flooded the bilge and main passageway with water. The virus would have to divert power from the engine room to pump out the water. This would slow the ship's movement speed and the cyborgs being functional, a perfect time to move around. As they explore the ship some more, they come across the missile that hit the ship. It turns out it never exploded, and the damage was caused by burning fuel and kinetic shock. They still have a warhead they can use. If they can lure the virus to the front of the ship, the detonation might not be so damaging so they could still use the ship to escape if this works. But all they need now is bait. Mr. Avril volunteers to get the cyborg's attention. He ventures down in the lower deck, past the flooded hallway, but then Apia shows up to help him. It doesn't take long until they are tracked down by something new. Another cyborg tears through the floor. It appears much larger than the others and more heavily armored. They toss a grenade at it, but it's not that effective. Appia stays behind to shoot it, but gets eliminated quickly. In the movie, the largest cyborg is called Goliath. As Mr. Avril runs up the stairs, he gives the signal to blow the warhead. They had little time to prepare, and the damage tears the ship in half, with both pieces starting to sink. The giant cyborg emerges from the smoke and fire. 
It sees the survivors and jumps towards them, but it doesn't reach the distance it planned. It falls into the water and sinks, only to reappear from underneath them. Two men try to fight back, but they get overpowered by the cyborg. Miss Foster releases the anchor and its heavy weight smashes through it and pushes its remains into the open waters. The movie version has the Goliath being destroyed within the ship when it explodes. With only two survivors left and no ships in the area, they might not last more than two days, unless the sharks get them. They are later saved by helicopters from Auckland. They picked up their SOS 36 hours ago, but other ships are also looking for that Chinese vessel. The ending in the comic book shows a floppy disk still in the ocean. This could be a way of leaving it open for a sequel, but the problem here is that a floppy disk would not be able to hold 20 gigabytes of alien AI data. But then again, this is just a story, so anything can happen. The movie version of the Russian ship is called the academic Vladislav Volkov. It was in fact a retired United States Navy transport ship, the USNS General Hoyt Vandenberg. And a video game was made in 1999 for the PlayStation 1 console. The title was Virus, It Is Aware, which is taken from the movie trailer. The virus is now referred to as evil. While the comic book and movie took place in open waters, the video game story had the ship making it to the port. This was a decision the developers took because they thought a ship on the open sea was too limited. And they also released action figures. They were made by the resource company. They were meant to advertise the movie. The script was sold to Dark Horse Comics because Chuck Farrer thought a movie adaptation could not replicate all the special effects required for the story, but they pulled it off. And a lot of work and dedication went into the movie. The names of some characters were changed from the comic book to the film, and despite their minor differences, they both delivered a fairly similar story. So that covers the comic book story of Virus. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like rating on it. I've covered a lot of franchises over the past few years, so check out my lore and history playlist. You might find something else to watch. Venom is one of the most popular villains in the Marvel Universe. Although his symbiote has been used by different hosts, his design has remained the same or at least similar in some way. While he has undergone very small changes to his physical body, or the way his symbol or eyes are drawn, there's actually a little story to his long tongue. Back when Venom first appeared in the comic books against Spider-Man, he didn't always have that crazy long tongue. In fact, it was the creator of Spawn, Todd McFarlane, who drew Venom in the early days. He was in charge of drawing Venom for a while, and this gave him time to see if the character was gaining popularity, and over time, the demand for Venom had increased. But when a story for Venom was continued, Todd McFarlane was not drawing Venom anymore during this time. Instead, a former Marvel writer and illustrator named Eric Larson had made a small modification to Venom's design. He decided to make the tongue slide out of the mouth and give it a creepy look. Although he is credited with making the small adjustment to Venom's tongue, he still praised Todd McFarlane's original design. Eric Larson had posted a little story about Venom's tongue on Facebook. He says that in the early days of Venom appearing in the comic book, Todd McFarlane's design did have a long tongue, but it never stuck out of the mouth. So he made one small adjustment and years later, this new design of the tongue just stuck with Venom, and they kept it like this ever since. But that's not to say that every appearance of Venom was like this. For example, when Venom appeared in the 2007 movie Spider-Man 3, he did have a visible tongue. However, it was not that long. And comparing this to the new Venom movie coming out soon, it seems they went with Eric's design instead. So that's a little history to Venom's tongue. Which design do you like more, the tongue inside or the long tongue outside? Let me know in the comment section. The Godzilla universe has a lot of monsters with very interesting designs and stories. They vary from their shape, origin, and intentions. One that I've always liked a lot is Mecha Godzilla. The original movie came out in 1974 in Japan, and it was named Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla. But later in 1977, it was released in the United States. But it went by different names like Godzilla vs. the Bionic Monster and Godzilla vs. the Cosmic Monster. It appeared in the movie as a clone of Godzilla, 
but its short battle with Anguirus would reveal something, a shiny piece of metal underneath its skin. As the story unfolds, his skin is burnt off when it battles Godzilla for the first time, revealing it is a mechanical version of Godzilla. The metals used on Mechagodzilla were not from Earth. Their origin was a mystery, but it's later revealed that it was created by a race of aliens and they wanted to conquer Earth. Mechagodzilla is eventually defeated with the combined efforts of Godzilla and King Caesar. Its head gets ripped off and it loses the battle. In 1975, they would bring back this metallic clone for another movie called The Terror of Mechagodzilla, but this time, Godzilla had to fight against two opponents, Titanosaurus and Mechagodzilla, but he ended up beating both of them. The Godzilla story would later introduce Mecha King Ghidorah, and at the end of that battle, the humans would take the technology from Mecha King Ghidorah to make a new version of Mechagodzilla. This one was meant to protect the human race from other monsters. One version was to make it an out of control machine, and later infected by a computer virus which made it self aware, but this idea was scrapped for another one. Some early concept art showed that its body was to be a mass collection of mechanical parts, but again, this idea was changed later on. Now, another story was to include Mechagodzilla being able to split apart into multiple vehicles. A great idea, but Again, it was later changed in the script for something else. This character would merge with Garuda to form Super Mecha Godzilla. During this encounter, Godzilla is badly injured, so Rodan sacrifices her energy to help Godzilla recover, and this is when Godzilla uses its new Red Spiral Atomic Breath to destroy Super Mecha Godzilla. And just like what happened with Mecha King Ghidorah, Super Mecha Godzilla's remains are picked up by another alien race to form Mogera. After this battle, it would be a long time before we saw Mecha Godzilla return to the movies. The next version was a combination of mechanical parts and the skeletal remains of the original Godzilla that was killed in 1954. This one was named Kiryu. During their battle, this one ends up getting the upper hand. But when Godzilla lets out a final roar, this awakens the spirit of the original Godzilla that's within Mechagodzilla's body. The pilot loses control of the machine, and Mechagodzilla takes the injured Godzilla into the ocean, and the movie ends. So it turns out, it just cannot bring itself to destroy another Godzilla. Mechagodzilla was mentioned once more in the anime movies. The first time was in Godzilla, Planet of the Monsters. It was supposed to battle against other monsters, but when Godzilla attacked the city, it was abandoned before they could activate it. After 20,000 years had passed, Mechagodzilla's nanotechnology started to spread from its body. This would go as far as creating what they called Mechagodzilla City. The nanotechnology was actually a metal liquid that required a lot of power. It was able to reshape its body and even regenerate any damaged areas. The metal was so strong that it could even deflect Godzilla's atomic breath, something that was used by the city during an attack. Some early illustrations showed the monster had new weapon designs, like a neutron cannon, a blade launcher, and a hyper lance. As one of the most popular monsters in the Godzilla universe, Mechagodzilla has been seen in a few movies, comic books, and multiple video games. It remains as one of the earliest characters, which has become a fan favorite. A black version of Mechagodzilla did appear in the 1997 TV series. It's apparently 10 times stronger than the original. Its name is a combination of Mecha, which is something mechanical, and Godzilla. Together they form the name Mechagodzilla, which is obvious. So that covers the different versions of Mechagodzilla and its history. Which design is your favorite? Tell me in the comment section. Terminator Origins What character was chosen as the face of the Terminator? Throughout the Terminator movies, we never found out who owned the face that was placed on the T-800 models. This Terminator was designed with living synthetic flesh and used for infiltration missions. A neural net processor was placed inside its central computer so that it could learn and adapt to the situations on its mission. After the story of Terminator 2, Cyberdyne was destroyed, but its technology was obtained by the government. Skynet, along with other projects, are then continued by a company known as Cyber Research Systems. Now, it wasn't until Terminator 3, in a deleted scene, 
where we learn of whose face was placed on the T-800s. Their plan was to place robots on the front lines of war so American lives would not be lost, and they chose Master Sergeant William Candy as the face for the Terminator we all know today. He spoke with a southern accent, but it was replaced with another voice when the project was complete. Skynet is eventually created in the future, and they continue to keep William Candy's face on the Terminator. It's kind of funny how they originally used the face of a human that was trying to save lives. But later on, this face was placed on the first Terminator that was sent back in time to eliminate Sarah Connor. When this mission failed, another T-800 like this one was captured by John Connor in the future and reprogrammed to protect the young John Connor. Now the novels of the Terminator 2 trilogy also mention another person that looked very similar to William Candy. He went by the name of Dieter von Rosbach. He was a former CIA agent who retired and went on to live as a cattle rancher until the year 2029. He eventually meets Sarah and John Connor and joins them in the resistance against the machines. This novel says that Dieter's physical appearance became the basis for the T-800 Terminator seen in the first two movies. Another connection some people have made was between Predator and Terminator. At the end of Predator, the character Dutch disappears, but his image is brought back in the 1994 arcade game Alien vs Predator. The information on Dutch Schaefer in this game says he's a cyborg created to battle extraterrestrials. He's even given the code of CDS-170A3. There was speculation that CDS stands for Cyberdyne Systems. After the incident in Predator, Cyberdyne Systems wanted to use the image of Dutch for the T-800 because he was the first person to defeat these extraterrestrials known as Predators. And even in the Aliens universe, the android Ash from the first movie had something similar. It was manufactured by Hyperdyne Systems and given the code 120-A-2, which translates to HDS-120-A2. Now keep in mind, these codes about Schaefer and Ash are not really connected or related. They just look very similar in a way. But it's also a good source if they were to ever connect all these characters into one story. But which story did you like more in connection to the face of the Terminator? Let me know your answer in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a like on it. And that wraps up another video surrounding film and history. As I bring back these older videos, maybe some new subscribers can find something that they missed over the years. I'm always looking to look into other franchises, be it horror, sci-fi, action, or even comic book stories. If there's something you want me to look at, just put it down in the comments section. To see more videos like this, just subscribe to my channel. And thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.